Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, let me pray for us this morning, and then uh, we'll begin our service together. Uh, if you're joining us from home, we want to welcome you as well. We're glad uh, you're joining us today. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for who you are, and we thank you for this morning. We thank you that uh, you are present and here and with us. You are Emmanuel, God. And you are the one we need this morning. And so I pray even in this moment, as we just slow down for a minute and just sit and be still, help us to know that you are God, worthy of all our praise. You are the one who holds us together. And in this space, God, would you open our eyes so we could see you. God, would you move freely here in this place and meet with us where we're at. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, can we stand together? I'm going to sing this song just like a testimony. And many of us have it and can testify of God's goodness and the things that he's done. And so uh, we'll sing this together. It's an easy one, I hope. So.
God, we thank you for who you are. And we remember again this morning the privilege it is to bear your name. The name that at, at, at the sound of it, every knee will bow and confess that you are Lord. In your name, God, so many things happen, miraculous things, because it's you, God. You are the one who, who does it all and holds it all together. And so this morning, we, we look to you and, and we get to say your name and say that we love you, God. And we confess that you are beautiful and wonderful and powerful. And we are so thankful to be your kids. And I pray this morning as we stand in your presence, in your great and holy presence, God, that we can still be safe because we are covered in the name of Jesus. And so this morning we look to you to do all things for us. We don't want to look anywhere else. We don't want to go to the things that are going to leave us dry. And so God, would you reveal yourself again to us here in this place this morning? Help us to hear your voice and to see you. Would you breathe hope and life into us so that we would know these truths, that we would cling it and hide it in our heart and guard it, that you are reigning above it all. You are over all things and we can trust you. So we choose again this morning to keep our eyes fixed on you, God, and we offer you all of ourselves. We offer you uh, this time together that we're here. Move freely in this place, Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. I'll try it one more time. Good morning, everyone. Oh, there you go. That's great. It's great to be with you today. If we haven't met, my name is Gina. And uh, if you're new, so glad that you're joining us today. If you're joining us online, welcome as well. And uh, I'm going to actually ask you to go ahead and grab a seat. And I'm going to share some things that are happening in the life of our church. Um, one of the things that we hope is that you go from feeling like a guest here to truly feeling like this church is home. And uh, uh, one of the ways you can do that is to get plugged in and serve somewhere. And so some of you received this on your way in, or if you didn't, you can grab one on your way out. But in this handout is just all these different ways you can serve all across the church. And uh, when I think about feeling like a guest to feeling at home, I think about what a friend said to me one time. She said, you know, you know you're at home at someone's house when they like tell you to go get a broom and sweep up the like breadcrumbs or they like tell you to go help get drinks out of the fridge like when you're actually doing some things to make the place work and so uh, I would tell you that all the needs that we have listed here are things that we really do need around the church so all the different areas are listed but I want to highlight a few of these for you today and they all tie into first impressions you know the the way you feel when you first show up here and and so some of the needs that we have are for people to greet at each of our doors we have several entrances into this building, so we've got needs there. We've got needs to drive the shuttle that comes from our remote parking lot to help with parking. We also have needs around our tech, things like lighting and sound and helping run the cameras and Zoom and things like that. And uh, if you're interested in that, just so you know, you don't need to know how to do it. We will train you. And when I say we, I mean not me, someone else, because I don't know how to do any of it. But I think Dosung over there knows what he's doing. He can help you learn everything you need to know. But look through this list. See if there's an area that, that sticks out to you. If you've got questions, reach out. A few different ways to sign up for this. You can scan this QR code and just fill in a form online, and then we'll be in touch with you this week. Or on this handout, you can fill this out and just hand it to a volunteer as you walk out. Or lastly, before you leave here today, there's a table in the back with some balloons on it. Stop by there if you're not sure where to serve. You've got questions about any of these areas. Uh, just swing by there, and they'd be happy to help you and answer any questions that you've got. So that's the first way I think you go from feeling like a guest to really being at home here. And the second has to do with the groups that are coming up. Um, when I think about 
How do we actually take our faith and move from being here on a Sunday morning, listening to teaching, and to actually live this out in our lives, watch our faith impact our families and our work and our neighborhoods? I think the best way to do that is to actually uh, really be in a group with other people here in this community and talk about the things that we're learning. And in October, as a church, we're actually going to dive into studying the book of James. It's incredibly practical, but it can be easy to come here on a Sunday morning, hear some things and just walk out and not really have it transform the way you live. And and so we've got lots of group options to help you with that this fall. And I want to highlight several of them, but what I want to do is actually show you where you can find all of the information. And it's on our website. So up here on the screen, I'll show you. If you type in hopecommunity.net, this will get you to our website. You click on Get Involved. And then once you click on that, you'll see it says Groups Fall 2024. And here you'll see all the different options. There's a foundations group if you're new to faith or just got baptized, that's a great option. We've got intergenerational groups. These are groups for people of all ages and stages of life, kids, adults, a whole family. Uh, They can come, and those groups actually meet once a month. Most of our groups meet weekly, but if you've got a busy schedule, intergenerational groups might be the place for you. And then you can see we've got all sorts of different study groups. We've got uh, men's groups and women's groups, couples groups, groups that are open to everyone. Some of these groups meet at the church, some meet at home. Homes. Um, we've got a Zoom group here at the end. That one's almost full, so if you're interested in that, please sign up today. But basically here you can click on each of these, sign up, get all the information. That's all on the website. We also have sports groups. So if you go back to get involved and click on sports, you'll see all the options here. We've got um, pickleball and basketball and volleyball. With these groups, you come, you show up here, you play together, you spend about 10 minutes just getting to know each other, praying for one another, but a lot of that time is spent you know, on the sports as well. So there's so many different ways to get involved. I'd encourage you, go online, pick one that works for you. Uh, most of our study groups meet weekly, and they meet for eight weeks, and so you kind of know the commitment ahead of time. Again, if that's hard for your schedule, these intergenerational groups, they meet once a month. It's a little more relaxed. You share a meal together, um, hang out, do a devotional, or sometimes you serve together. Or if sports is your thing, check out one of those groups. But I'd encourage you, uh, get plugged in, get involved, get to know some people, and um, really begin to explore how do you live out this faith that we talk about every Sunday. Uh, Last thing I want to share with you is if you are new to the church in the last several months, uh, we have a gathering coming up this Wednesday called New to Hope, and uh, you can register for it by clicking on this QR code right here or go to our website as well. And uh, again, if you're new, this is a chance to come meet some other people that are new as well, uh, to hear a little bit about the history of the church, and our staff pastors will be there. We just want to hang out with you, get to know you better, and we encourage you to be here for that. There is a meal as a part of this on Wednesday evening. So again, please RSVP because that'll help us plan for that. Now, we are in this teaching series that we're calling Face to Face. And in just a few minutes, Steve will be up to teach and Jason will be up to read our scripture. But before that, we'd like to give you some time in the service to get to know other people. And, or you can grab a cup of coffee or donut. But I thought today, if you could look for someone you don't know, introduce yourself, and maybe just share, like, when you think of home, What's the place that you think of, all right? So I'm going to ask you to go ahead, stand to your feet, look for someone you don't know, introduce yourself, and we'll come back together in a few minutes. Great. Well, again, welcome this morning. My name's Jason, one of the pastors here. And if it does happen to be your very first time with us, I want to invite you after service, stop by, say hi. Our welcome team in the lobby would love to greet you. They'd show you around if you'd like, answer any questions you might have. There's also a card on the back of the, the seats that you could uh, use to let us know that it's your first time. We'd love to follow up with you uh, during the week if that's the case. Uh, and then also just want to let you know, there, we have Bibles just outside of this room as you walk out of the door on your left on a bookshelf that are there for you if you don't have one. And so if, uh, you know, if you have a Bible already, don't add it to your collection. But if you're new or maybe you're wanting to explore faith a little bit and you don't own a Bible, that's what they're there for. So please feel free to... Grab one of those if you would like. Uh, Today, we are continuing the series that we've been in called Face to Face. And this morning, Steve is going to be teaching from Mark chapter 10, uh, verses 46 through 52. And so I'd like to read that for us now before he comes up to teach. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, 
was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Would you invite Steve as he comes up to teach? Hey, good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you. Welcome to those of you watching online. One thing I want to kind of just uh, take care of before we jump into the message. This uh, today is a special day in the life of one of our volunteers. John Clough likely was the one who greeted you outside. He, uh, he initiated fist bump Sunday, which we all agree is much better than face slap Sunday. Nobody liked that at all. It's John's 60th birthday today. So, yeah. So as you leave, give him a fist bump, tell him happy birthday. Uh, uh, he did not tell me it was his 60th, so I did think if this is his friend's idea of a joke, that would be a great joke, by the way, if he's like 45, that'd be awesome. Anyway, that's how my mind works. Hey, we're, we're in a series face-to-face. We're looking at Jesus' interactions with people, and we're trying to take those interactions, his words, his heart, we're trying to understand them and then apply it to our lives and our faith and our church. And, and when you're reading the Gospels, a couple things, when you're reading through the Gospels, first thing I tell you is it has layers. There's a surface, obvious layer, what's actually happening here that you can see. And then with some study, you'll see oh, there's multiple layers underneath that obvious story. And today's study is one of those. Uh, in this, you're going to see uh, one of the layers. Uh, there's more than one blind person in this story. You'll see it. Uh, one of the other layers, uh, at, at no point do they talk about prayer. No, no point do they even pray. And yet I think it has a lot to teach us about prayer. Does that sound good? So with that in mind, let's dive into the story. You heard it just read. The Mark captures it this way. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man named Bartimaeus was sitting by the roadside begging. All right, so Jesus... It, it, this is the story of Jesus making his move to Jerusalem for the last time. He's going through a famous city, Jericho, and, and, and this is like kind of the last stop before he gets to the place where his followers all think that will initiate his earthly kingship. Their anticipation is that he will lead the revolt against Rome and reestablish the greatness of Israel. That's the trip they're on. And in the midst of it, they walk by a man named Bartimaeus who's blind. Now, now just uh, if you're open to it, I'd love to ask you just for a moment, close your eyes and let's imagine what this guy's life was like. Would you close your eyes? Again, his day was marked by a darkness. Uh, Every day he was dependent on others. He couldn't work a job, so he needed help. Every day in Jericho, he would go to one of the roads, one of the crossroads likely, where there'd be lots of people walking by he would put his cloak down, he would sit on his cloak, and then, and then his ears would tell him people were coming by. While he couldn't see, he likely had a great sense of hearing. And he'd hear the footsteps come by, and then he would shout out, have mercy on me, meaning, could you give me a little money? Have mercy on me. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. And one of the other things he heard as he walked through the road was he would hear the town's gossip. He was likely a fixture in that town. People almost got used to him and just walked past him. But people would talk about the town gossip. Who's the new person in town? Who's dating? What's going on politically? What's happening in the world? He would hear it all. And in the midst of his studies and his listening, he heard them talk about some new rabbi named Jesus. He heard that he was this incredible teacher. He heard some of the people like talking about the sermons. Must be good. He heard some people tell that he had criticized the religious leaders, some of the hypocrisy. And the people began to wonder, is he more than just a good teacher? Is he a prophet? And even some had begun to talk about his miracles. One time he fed a huge group of people with almost nothing. 
He had healed people who couldn't walk, and he heard what really interested him. He had healed a blind person. You can open your eyes. As he listened to these stories, one day he went down, and he could tell it wasn't just a little crowd. There's a huge crowd on its way. He could hear the footsteps. And he could hear them talking, and he could hear them, they're talking about Jesus. They're, they're making a journey from Jericho to Jerusalem, and there's an excitement in their voices because they're going to make him king. And then he realizes Jesus is amongst them. He's walking with them. Jesus, the one who healed the blind, is going to walk right past them. And so in that moment, Bartimaeus decided something. He was going to do his best to get the miracle he needed. Mark tells us that when Bartimaeus heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, there's something in the context you may not grasp. The phrase son of David is a messianic phrase. This phrase, again, the the people of Israel had been looking for years for the Messiah. The the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures promised a Messiah would come that would restore Israel. And the belief was that he would restore Israel to the greatness of the king of David. So when you called him the son of David, the idea was you're acknowledging he's the Messiah. In Mark's gospel, this is the first public declaration that Jesus is the Messiah, partially because This is a rebellious act. You are basically rebelling against Rome's rule in making this declaration. And the first one who had the guts to say it publicly is Bartimaeus. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, had mercy on me. Wouldn't that lift your spirits if you were traveling with Jesus to hear people declare he's the Messiah? That someone who'd never heard him believed him? Maybe he's even going to join your ranks. Wouldn't you be excited to hear that? Not the response of Jesus' followers then. As he's shouting this out, the Bible tells us that many people rebuked him and told him to be quiet. My mom's on this. I hope she'll forgive me. They were telling him to shut up. Shut up. Stay quiet. Can you believe that? Jesus is going to Jerusalem, and they're saying, he's too busy for you. He's got bigger fish to fry. He's not going to stop. Why don't you just be quiet? Oh, I told you that there's more than one blind person in the story. Mark's gospel, if you didn't know, it has an overarching theme. It's a thread that goes through the entire thing. And it's the question, who in this story can actually see what's happening? And Jesus' disciples frequently are the ones who aren't getting it. They're spiritually blind. Let me unpack this for you. This is Mark 8, just two chapters before this. Jesus has called his disciples. They've heard him preach and teach. They've seen miracles, and then he says this line to them with some frustration. He says, do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see? Translation, are you blind? You've got ears, but you're failing to hear. Jesus is seeing, he's doing all the things, and they're getting little bits and pieces, but their minds can't grasp all that he is. It continues. Uh, There's just a little bit later in that chapter 8, there's a point where Jesus asks Peter, who do you think I am? And he says, some say a prophet, but he goes, but who do you say I am? And he says, I think you're the Messiah, first person to do it. I think you're the Messiah. He's the first person, but it's private. And just a few verses later, it says, Jesus rebukes Peter, get behind me, Satan. That's rough, isn't it, when Jesus says that to you? Why did he say it? Here's why. You don't have in mind the concerns of God, but human concerns. Translation, you're blind to my mission. You're not getting it. And then you go into just a couple chapters later, the chapter that we're in, before they interact with blind Bartimaeus, there's a point where Jesus is hanging with a crowd, and the story tells us that people were bringing their kids to Jesus for him to place his hands on, say a blessing for their kids. That sounds nice, doesn't it? But the disciples rebuked them. The disciples are like, he doesn't have time for children's ministry. And Jesus, it says, was indignant with them. 
Indignant, why? Because they're missing his whole mission. Jesus had said, my mission is not to be served, but to serve. And the disciples frequently are acting as a barrier for him to live out that mission. They're getting in the way. And his frustration's evident. I called you guys to help expand my mission and my impact, not to limit it. But frequently they're saying, hey, he doesn't have time for kids. Hey, he's too busy for you. And on this day, they're saying to a blind man who's hoping for healing, shut up. See the blindness? I told you there's more than one blindness, didn't I? And through this whole gospel, Mark's trying to indicate that it's going to take a while for the disciples to really get what's going on. Now, let's pause in the story and let's apply this. This is good news for us and also difficult news. It's good news because there's hope for those of us who are still trying to figure out what the Bible's saying. And the Bible does indicate there's a process. You get it piece by piece, but few people grasp it right away. That's the good news. The difficult news is good-hearted people who are Christians can get things really wrong. You heard when Jesus said to, to Peter, get behind me, Satan. He said, your mind is set on things of earth, not heaven. You, you've got the heart for this world, but not God's heart. And many of the stories, if you know Christian history, when things go wrong, is when a Christian has the wrong heart. They're, they're thinking about earthly things, not heavenly things. Does this make sense? And the Bible would go, you're blind. Blind. You can miss it. It's where, again, we've tried to do this as a church. We, we've tried as a staff to root ourselves. That's one of the core values. Is we just ask the question, are we serving people? Because at the core of Jesus' mission, when the disciples get it right, they're just trying to serve people, like Jesus said. Does this make sense? But again, the great danger, and this is why I encourage you, read the Bible. So I encourage you, get into groups like Gina talked about earlier. Get in a community where you can actually process faith and have the humility to understand that if Peter, James, and John, and the others could be blind, you and I can too, can't we? And so that's where you need someone, you need to just have the humility to go, hey, am I missing this? Am I a little bit off? Am I a little spiritually blind? And the good friend is the one who goes, yeah, I think you might be. Back to the story. He is sitting there begging for Jesus to save him. Son of David, have mercy on me. And these followers tell him to stop and to shut up. And then it says this phrase that many rebuked him, told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more. Can you say that with me? He shouted all the more. Oh, that's so good. You know how tempting it would be to be that guy and all these people are telling you to shut up? And I would be so tempted to just kind of, okay, I guess it's not my day. Some of you, when you talk to think about prayer, some of you have a voice in your head that tells you it's not worth praying. He's not listening. He's got bigger fish to fry. And I hope you and I and our church is a church that follows his example, that when that voice says, hey, just shut up, you and I, like Bartimaeus, shout all the more. You and I, like Bartimaeus, pray a little louder. You and I, like Bartimaeus, refuse to stay quiet when that voice tells us to be quiet. Calm down. God doesn't have time for your petty things. You and I, I hope we encourage each other. It's time to shout a little more. Don't you agree? I love this about this guy, that when a crowd told him to shut up, he shouted all the more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. What happens? Oh, two of my favorite words. Jesus stopped. Jesus stopped. Jesus came to this earth to do a mission, very clear. He wants to teach humanity about God's nature. He wants to reveal himself to humanity. He's then on a mission from that point of teaching and healing and establishing his identity. He's going to Jerusalem. It's been, the Bible describes from all time, for all human history, this has been the plan. So he knows Jerusalem's the goal and Jerusalem's right in front of him. He knows that within days he will be crucified he will die on a cross that will pay for the sins, all of our sins, and he chose this. He wanted us paid for. He would not only die on the cross, he's just days from being buried in the grave. He knew that was the plan, and he's just days from rising from the grave to a promise eternity to all who will believe in him. It's right there, right in front of him. And if you're tempted to think Jesus is too busy for the one person, this 
two words stand out to me. Jesus stopped. He stopped. Apply it to us real quick. Every now and then I'll hear a phrase. I'll say, hey, anything I can pray for you? And they go, ah, it's nothing big. God's got bigger things to do. Oh, uh, uh, don't worry about me. It's nothing big. And I go, that's the mindset of the disciples. Have the mindset of Bartimaeus. There are big things in front of Jesus. There are earth-shattering things in front of Jesus, but nothing he won't stop for. Does this make sense? So don't you ever underestimate God's desire to stop. I think Jesus loved that moment. He heard someone who had a need, and he stopped. That he heard someone who had a prayer request, and he stopped. Oh, Jesus stopped, and then he said, call him. So funny, the same people that were saying, shut up, Jesus, Jesus doesn't go to the man. Jesus tells them, why don't you go call him to me? Isn't that good? Jesus it kind of rubs it in his face, doesn't it? Like, it's like I kind of imagine it's Peter, James, and John. They're telling him, be quiet. And he goes, why don't you guys go get him for me? Lead him, get him on your arm, walk him right up to me. And they do just that. They bring him right to him. It says that when Bartimaeus heard Jesus had called for him, he throws his clothes aside, he jumps to his feet, and he comes to Jesus. And then Jesus asks him this question, what do you want me to do for you? Multiple times, Jesus asks people, what do you want me to do for you? He asked James and John this question previous to this, and they basically described they would be at, like to be at the left hand and the right hand of him when he comes into his kingdom. It's a power play. They're basically trying to get it over the other 12 and go, we would like to be your favorites, not the rest of them, and we'd like to be the vice president and the chairman of the treasury, if that's okay with you. And Jesus is like, I don't think you know what you're talking about. Here, blind Bartimaeus has the correct answer, and it's a beautiful prayer. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Rabbi, I want to see. All right, pause for a second. Let's talk about this. For me, this is one of the most sincere, heartfelt, beautiful prayers and such a great example for all of us. I'm going to just, you guys know I like to interact. Have you ever heard someone pray, but they don't sound the same when they pray as when you talk to them? Anybody else had this experience? Like they throw in some these and some thous and some shouts and you're like, well, who, who, what, what are you doing? Sometimes we can be confused that with our words, we have to impress God. Notice, he does nothing. It's the most simple, sincere, heartfelt prayer. Uh, he doesn't pray a long prayer. It's short. Very short. Some of you, and the Bible describes it, sometimes people can think, the longer I pray, the more likely I am to get an answer to prayer. Preachers believe this all the time. The longer we preach, the more likely you'll like us. That's really what it is, right? Right? But it's a great example here. He says, Rabbi, so simple. That's a, that, that is a term of, of understanding, and it's a term of humility. Rabbi, meaning you're the teacher, I'm the student. Rabbi, meaning I respect you. Rabbi, meaning I'm looking up to you. Rabbi, it establishes you're above me. Rabbi. And then the simplicity and sincerity, he just lays it out. I want to see. He doesn't say, if you can, like we heard last week. If you can, I'd like to be able to see. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, if you're able to. He doesn't even say, if it's within your will. He just simply says, here's what I want. And it's a beautiful step of faith. And notice something else here. It's an immensely risky sentence to ask because he could be disappointed. He could be disappointed. You you may not know this, but in the history, if if you study the history, at Jesus' time, there are other faith healers wandering around these areas. And maybe he had sat with one of those and been disappointed. We don't know. We don't know. But in our, again, in our our lives, yours and mine, it is an incredibly vulnerable thing to lift your prayers up to God. To say, God, Jesus, Savior, this is what I want. Oh, I hope we have both the tenacity of this guy and the faith to simply pray what we want. And, And just say, this is what I'd ask for. I don't have to pray a long time, but God, you know what I want. This is what it is. How'd Jesus respond? He says, go your faith has healed you. 
And immediately the man received his sight and he followed Jesus along the road. So much happens in this sentence. See, Jesus heals all sorts of people. Part of what's interesting in this story is this is one of the few, I can only think of two stories where the person healed, we know their name. Peter's mom is healed and we don't know her name. That tells you something. But Bartimaeus, we've got his name and we've got Lazarus, those two. It's the only two I can think of. Why did we know his name? Because he didn't act like any of the other people who were healed. The majority of time when Jesus healed someone, they went back to their normal life. You think about, there's a story I love about 10 lepers who are all healed. They start running to town. One turned back to say thank you, but then he went on with his normal life. Jesus tells him, you go, you're healed. Did you notice what he did? Instead of going back to his normal life, he followed him. He followed him to Jerusalem, he was there. He followed him to Jerusalem, he was there at the cross, he was there at the empty grave. Likely, historians believe, he becomes one of the leaders in the church, blind Bartimaeus. One of the many people of that early church you can imagine would stand up and go, hey, I was blind, you guys saw me, I was in Jericho, he healed me. Bartimaeus didn't just go back to his normal life, you can see he's convinced this is the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior, because he follows him. He follows him. And there's a piece in this that I want to sit with, but I'm not sure I'm going to answer it for you, but I'll I'll invite you into the tension. Throughout the Bible, and especially the Gospels, when it talks about healings, there is a connection between faith and healings. Now, now I'm going to be very honest with you that I don't fully grasp this. I acknowledge it's there, but I don't understand all its implications. I can tell you I don't agree with some pastors I've heard who say it's quid pro quo. If you've got faith, you'll be healed. If you don't have faith, you won't. I don't believe that, just so I'm clear with you. But there is some connection between faith and prayer and healings and things like that. There's some connection throughout Scripture. So I'm not answering it for you. I just want to acknowledge that to you, that Bartimaeus' faith was this. He was willing to stand when everyone told him to sit down. He was willing to shout when everyone told him to be quiet. And he demonstrated faith that he believed Jesus was who he said he was. And he believed he could do what he said he could do. And he had no doubt about that in the way he prayed. And I think the invitation for you and I is to have that same kind of faith. Does this make sense? To pray bold prayers. They don't have to be long, but they take some guts. To, to not listen to that voice in our head that tells us it's not going to happen or the doubts that we have, but to ignore it and shout all the louder and to be people of faith. So I don't know your season of life, but I will tell you, part of what I love at this story is in the darkness and the difficulty that Bartimaeus was in, he still had faith and he still believed. In those days when he wondered if this is all there was, he had the guts to stand up when people told him to sit down and ask God for what he needed. And in those difficult moments, he didn't have to prove anything. He just had to be himself and say what it is he wanted. I can find very few other great teachings that I would tell you to look to more than this blind man who regained his sight and followed Jesus. And that's my hope for us. My hope is as a church, we pray this way. My hope as a church actually is that we pray for each other this way. My hope is that we invite each other to pray and we share with each other our concerns and our pains and our desires and that you and I stand before God on behalf of each other for your brother and your sister and pray for them, believing he can, yes? So I wanna do something different today, if that's okay with you. Is that okay with you? Okay, so, my conviction is some of you could use some prayer. I I don't know who, but my conviction is some of you, my sense is some of you could use somebody else praying for you, and I would love to pray for you, and Gina and Jason would love to pray for you, so I think we'll do this. In a moment, I'll have you stand up, I'll say a closing prayer, and you're welcome to go, but if you need prayer, I'd invite you to come right down here, and we would love to pray for you. And, and, and whatever it is, you just come up and say, this is what, this is what it is, and we'll pray. And, uh, and, 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 and some of you will be tempted to walk out the doors, and I would encourage you not to. Uh, one of my friends, years ago, I did this exact same invitation, and, and, uh, and, and, and we prayed with people, it got done, we were tearing stuff down, and then my friend came down the room and, and said, I, I, I knew I was supposed to pray with you, but I, I just didn't want to, so I left 
but I've been sitting in my car wrestling whether I should do this or not, and I finally decided I'm gonna come in for prayer, is that okay? And I said, no, we're done, it's, you missed it. <laughs> no, of course not. No, I, it was an honor to pray for him then. But I thought, it's so human, right? I thought, I've been that way too, where I felt compelled to do something, but my fear gets the better of me, or I look at the line, I go, no, or, or I go, other people have bigger things than me, right? I would just tell you, if you have a sense, you go, I would like prayer, please come down. It's actually an honor for us to hear a little bit of your story, and we'll not just pray for you here, but we're gonna pray for you ongoing. Does that make sense? So that's the invitation. So why don't you stand up now, and we'll say a closing prayer, and then if you feel moved and want, we come down here for prayer. So let's pray. God, this is my prayer. You, you know, God, honestly, the, the big prayer, now that I think about it, I have for our church, is might we be one of the churches that can see? That our hearts and minds are attuned to you and your kingdom, and we're not so consumed with this earthly thing. I mean, obviously, God, earth matters, but God, our motives can get twisted, our pride can come in, different desires. God, as a church, my hope is that we are honest with each other and that we help each other see. God, I know there's many in this room who have real needs, physical needs, health needs, faith needs. God, I know some have financial issues and job issues and relationship issues. I don't know them all, but you do. So God, would you unleash your grace on this church? Would you unleash your power on this church? Might they see your hand at work? And God, what I'd ask is if you answer prayers, they would respond the same way Bartimaeus did, that they don't just go away grateful the prayer was answered and go back to life as normal, but it increases their faith and they're willing to follow you. God, that is my prayer. We pray this now in the name of Christ. And everyone agreed and said? Amen, amen, amen. Well, it's so good to be with you. Thanks so much for being part of today. And uh, again, if you need a Bible, feel free to grab one. If you wanna talk about getting connected, stop by. And if you need prayer, I hope you'll come down here. Have a great day. Blessings.